it's going to be one of those. But those are real life happenings, and it's every day. Every day you're going to find a description. You good with that? All right. And on there also, on those orders, and we'll get to this in a little while, is going to be treatment orders. There's going to be, you know, uh, inline aerosolized medication orders. Those are going to be there. So you're going to have to verify those as well. But they'll be here on the chart. Okay, so then we're going to wash hands, don gloves. Okay, you're just going to verbalize that stuff. Uh, introduce self and verify the patient's ID. Now, a lot of you are going to get to the point where you're like, why do I need to introduce myself to this patient? Because this patient's sedated. They, they don't, they're not moving at all. And, uh, but the, the deal is, is that, you know, I'm sure you've been told this and have heard this time and time again, that even though patients are sedated or in a coma, whether it's pharmacologically induced or trauma induced, whatever it is, they'll, they can hear you. Mm -hmm. You've heard that, right? Yeah. You've heard people coming out of comas or coming out of sedation and said, I heard everything that person said. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, I wish I had uh, saved the site for this neurologist who, when she was a teenager, was a patient on a ventilator in that state. And she heard everything that was going on, but couldn't respond to it at all. And she said she hated it when people walked in the room and wouldn't say a word and just started touching her and doing this and probing her and poking her and all this stuff. She said it was terrifying because when somebody came in the room, she would not know what was going to happen. She didn't know what to expect, but she loved it when people would say, hey, good morning. How are you doing? Everything okay? Would touch her and, you know, and assure her that, you know, everything was, was going to be okay. And and explain what they were doing. So you need to get into that practice. We all need to get into that practice of introducing ourselves to the patient. Okay, ensure that the BVM, number four, ensure that the bag valve mass, peep valve, which must be said to the ordered peep, the oxygen tubing and the flow meter are in the room. All right, so uh, if I can reach this. <coughs> Alright, let's see what we got in this bag. What is in this bag? Okay, so we have our VV, no, we have our BVM. Okay, and if I include the top and I squeeze it, I can see that it's all put together well. It's sealing. Okay. I see that there is a mask in there. Well, what do I need a mask for? The patient's intubated. As you're going to discover, patients don't always remain intubated. Sometimes the patients will deliberately pull out their tubes. Sometimes the patients will be turned and the tube will get pulled out of their mouth. There's all kinds of ways that tubes come out of people's mouths. And in, in, in which case, you have to be ready to ventilate them with a mask. So this has to be there. You have to have the oxygen line there, and there should be a peep valve. There's no peep valve here, so we would have to get one. And we would have to make sure that the peep valve is, it depends on the, the, uh, the way the facility works, I'll explain that in a minute, but we have to make sure that the peep valve is available and set to whatever the peep is on the ventilator. Now, uh, I think I've demonstrated to you before with the with the pig lung and with the resuscitator bag with peep that if you if you disconnect a patient, if you have peep on a patient and you disconnect the patient from the ventilator, they lose the peep in about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 seconds. The alveoli start recruiting. The higher the PEEP level, the more dangerous that is for a patient because they need those high PEEP levels just to maintain a minimal oxygenation. And so you take a patient off of that, they de-recruit in about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 seconds, and then they start to desaturate and it could get to be a mess. Well, if you have to take a patient off a ventilator, let's just say they're on 10, 12, 15 a PEEP, if you have to take them off a ventilator you, and put them on a... a bag valve mask, resuscitator bag, you have to have the same peep on this bag that's on that bed and you have to put it on there quickly so that the lung doesn't de-recruit and the patient desaturate. Do you understand that? All right. So part of your patient system ventilator check is ensuring that this equipment is in the room and it's all operational and all the components are there. 
You know what these instructors are going to do to you in the practicum? You have any idea? They're going to take something out. Oh, they'll nice. take something out. For sure they will, right? And you know why they do that? They're not trying to be nasty or clever or anything like that. I hope you make sure, make sure you have everything. That's going to be exactly how it's going to go in real life. You're going to go into the unit and the mask is going to be missing. The whole resuscitator bag might be missing. The mask might be missing and the peep valve might be missing. It's the way it really goes. So during this practicum, make sure you check every component because I know these instructors, they're going to take something away. So you want to catch those instructors. All right, let them know you know your stuff. Hey, no peep valve in here, buddy. <laughs> so anyways, and make sure that it's set to the proper peep, okay? You good with that? All right. Okay, assess patient sensorium. How are you today, Ms. So-and-so? Give them a little tap on the shoulder. You know, can you hear me? I'm here to do this and that. Most of the time, uh, and for this practicum, guess what? All the patients are sedated. All the patients are going to be sedated. Sedated and unresponsive. Okay, that's the way that they're going to be. And it says underneath there, it says record on the flow sheet. Your flow sheet for this practicum will look just like the back side of the sheet that I just gave you. Okay. And so you're going to record that. You see where it says patient assessment right here on the back? That's where you're going to make your notes. So you could say, you know, you could say patient sedated, you know, unresponsive to commands. That would be a sufficient note. But the idea is that you check the patient sensory. Now the patient position is important. The patient's head, uh, the head of the bed needs to be elevated 30 degrees. Unless your patient is hemodynamically unstable, which means that they're hypotensive and the patient has been flattened, laid down flat, or is in uh, a trendelenburg. But uh, why, do you guys remember why the head of the bed would need to be elevated on these patients? Because of the intracranial pressure? The what? the intracranial pressure can increase? That could be for that kind of patient, for a patient with head trauma, yeah. Or, you know, it's a cerebral vascular accident, things like that. That's a consideration. But what else? What else is just regular routine stuff? Why does every patient's head have to be elevated 30 degrees? The gastric shock. What's that? The gastric aspirate. Okay, all right, that's exactly right. Because we don't want any of the gastric juices, any of the gastric juices coming up out of the esophagus into the mouth and then dripping down around the endotracheal tube cup and then dripping into the lungs. Because I don't know if you remember this when we were talking about the gram negative uh, bacteria that exist inside the, the stomach and how they can cause terrible infections, ventilator, ventilator required pneumonias. So that's part of routine care, making sure that that patient is up 30 degrees. You're responsible for that. So if your patient is down and your patient is flat and you come in the room, what do you think you should, how do you think you should respond? But what if the blood pressure is like, you know, 70 or 40? Should you be raising the head of the bed? So what, what might you do? I know what you would do. You'd ask the, ask the nurse. You know, you'd look at the blood pressure and say, okay, you want the head of the bed down? You know, you'd verify it. And if the nurse said, yes, you would leave it. If not, you would say, okay, I'm going to put the head of the bed up. And, and they all know. The nurses know as well as the respiratory therapist that the patient's head of the bed has to be up to prevent aspiration and to prevent ventilator-acquired pneumonia. If the patient gets ventilator-acquired pneumonia, their chances of dying is greatly increased. Okay, so the patient's position is important. You guys know how to set the patient position? Okay, there's a gauge, there's a degree gauge. Debbie's looking at it right now. What, are, what, what degree is the head of the bed set at right now? 30, okay, good. So there's a little indicator on the head of the, on the, on the side rail of the bed there. It will tell you what degree the bed is at. Good. All right, assess the patient's vital signs. Um, okay, we're gonna have uh, faux or fake monitors. Okay, we're gonna have fake monitors that are gonna be up here. They'll be on top of the IV pole put up here. Um, 
They are the flattest monitors you've ever seen. They're made out of paper. <laughs> but on those, you'll have, you know, you'll have everything. You'll have your heart rate, blood pressure, you'll have uh, temperature, and you'll have entitled CO2. You'll have all that. I'll, I'll get them in a few minutes and put them up when I finish explaining what we're doing here. All right, so those, you'll need to record them. So when it says record something, what does that mean? Right. That means get to your flow sheet. <laughs> All right, so on the back here, you're going to record your flow sheet. There's no specific place for vitals, so that means they're going to have to go under your patient. Now, when you get to your unit, you'll probably have either, people aren't using forms much any, anymore. They're using digital, you know, electronic medical records. So, you know, when you get there, they'll show you how to use their system and you'll chart that stuff in there. So you'll assess the vital signs and you'll have to record them in the patient assessment section. Auscultate breath sounds. All right, here we go. Let's make that broad. Uh, stethoscope here. Ladies, get it. I'm so right in there. Maybe if I'm not bothering you, you're not bothering me. Now, you, you know, when you were trained to do auscultation on your awake, alert, on, you know, uh, unintubated, non-intubated patients, you know, you were probably trained to maybe start in the bases to look for crackles, and then you went on from there. And you probably had four or five positions, one, two, three, four, five, or four, whatever, something like that. Uh, in the ICU, you're going to do a more abbreviated type of auscultation. First, what you're going to do is you're going to listen. You're going to listen here. Okay, you're going to listen to the anterior and apical segments right here of the upper lobes. And what you're going to hear up here most of the time is what we call coarse crackles, or some people call them the old term bronchi. bronchi. Okay, and you'll hear a rumbling. It's a rumbling. And you'll hear it most of the time on inspiration. And what that's indicating to you is, is that there's secretions in the large airways that need to be suctioned. All right. Now, if I hear that on auscultation, and you should wait for the vent to give the breath, and then you auscultate, then you'll hear the sound, and again, wait for a complete exhalation. Listen to a couple breaths. If you hear a lot of rumbling, and yet you continue auscultating, when it continue moving down the chest, guess what you're going to hear? Rumbling. And if you go around backwards, <coughs> what you're going to hear? Rumbling. Or a scratch, you're going to hear it everywhere. It's like noise pollution. It just drowns out all the other breath sounds. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is what your practice should be in the clinic, and this is what your practice should be for this practicum, is you're going to auscultate right here, these anterior sections of the upper, uh, right here. And for every practicum, for this practicum, for every patient, they're all going to have coarse crackles right there. So you're going to stop. What do you think you're going to do now? Yeah, you're going to suction. All right. You're going to do all that. Good. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure you're going to make sure that it's, it's became disconnected, but it's all right for now. We'll just pretend. But make sure that your regulator is set properly, okay, uh, and to the right pressures. You're going to then pre-oxygenate your patient, and on every one of these vents, there's a button there that does, it either is a button for 100% oxygen, and it'll give you 100% oxygen for two minutes. And then there on this vent, there's a second button that says silence the alarms. Because once you start suctioning a patient, there's two things that will happen. One, you're pulling volume out of the patient, so your volume alarms are going to go off if they're set right. And the other thing that might happen is, is that when you hit the crying of the patient might cough, and if the patient coughs, then your pressure alarms are going to go off. So every time you suction a patient, you can have all kinds of alarms going off. And you don't want that to happen. You don't want everybody thinking there's something wrong with the patient. Uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to hit the 100% oxygen, and you're going to hit the alarm silence button. And then you're going to give the patient 30 seconds to pre-oxygenate with that 100% oxygen. Now some of these ventilators, there's a button on there that says suction. And when you press that suction button, guess what it does? 
on, well, we wish it was sunshine. Wouldn't that be nice? Just walk around and press buttons. The nurses would like, they'd love that. But what it does is it does these two functions. It turns the oxygen up to 100% for two minutes and it silences the alarm. So one button. Some of those vents have that. Okay, not all of them. Just to let you know. All right, so I have I'm in a 100% oxygen and I'm going to silence my alarms. And now you look, I have a timeline here. There's two minutes that this is going to go for me. You know, I got to do it from this side. All right, so uh, anyways, this is a type of closed sheath suction system. It's, it's probably not the one you're going to see in the hospitals. The one you see in the hospitals is made by a company named Ballard. Everybody even calls it Ballard. And it's got a locking. I'll show you one right here. We just happened to have destroyed all the ones that we had. So we bought another brand and we, I mean, we bought some more and they were the wrong kind. But you see, they, they have these locks on them. Okay, now it's open. Oh, no, now it's locked. Now it's open and I can activate it and it'll activate the suction. And then when I'm done, I'll turn it and lock it. And now it can accidentally be turned. But that's, this is what you're going to find. This, this is one for a trick because it's so short. <coughs> so I didn't put them on these mannequins. But anyways, the ones that we have here for you to use that are pulling are a different kind. And I don't see a locking mechanism on them. But, I, but the activating mechanism is here. And it has this shield which prevents ac uh, accidental activation. Mm -hmm. That's the way this works. So anyways, I've pre-oxygenated my patient. Okay, silence the alarms. 30 seconds later, I am ready to suction the patient. I'm going to tell the patient, you have some mucus in your lungs. I'm just going to suction it out. I don't, I don't uh, like that, the explanation. I'm going to suction you. <laughs> like, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway. Where? I'm sure after you've done it 10 times, I mean, they'll figure it out. But I just don't like it. I'm going to suction you. <laughs> what? Uh, you have some, you have some mucus in your lungs. I'm going to go ahead and clean it out, suction it out. Okay, something like that. All right. So what you want to do is let me get rid of myself a little line here. Yeah, I'm already pre-oxygenated. I'm going to take and I'm going to straighten out this tube because the suction catheter is going to go in much easier if you straighten out the tube. So I straighten out the tube. I just lift the tube. I'm going to lift the tube. I'm going to, I'm going to hold it up like this so it's straight. And, and now I'm going to insert this. I'm going to insert this until I feel the resistance when I touch the carina. When you touch the carina, one or two things will happen. Either nothing will happen because the patient doesn't have a cough reflex, or you'll stimulate a cough reflex. And sometimes it'll be just a gentle cough, and sometimes it'll be a violent cough. Yeah. Sometimes it'll be, you know, the patient will start jumping on the bed. But anyways, once you hit the carina, pull back just a little bit, come off the carina, and then start suction. Okay, you suction, release, pull back, suction, release, pull back, suction, release, pull back. And this is what, this is how I teach it. If you're suctioning, you can tell when you're in a pool of mucus. You can absolutely tell it. Mm -hmm. You'll feel it, you'll hear it. If there's no mucus, you'll also hear that. It's just a clear vacuum kind of sound. But when you hit a pool of mucus, okay, why would you keep pulling back? Because what's going to happen is if there's a pool of mucus here and here's your catheter and you just pull straight through it like that, if you just do this, okay, some people swear by this technique and it, it's not a hill I'm going to die on, but my thinking, and, there, and there's nothing in a book will tell you, yeah, you have to do it this way. There's nothing like that. But here, here's a common technique. Activate. And pull. pull back. Okay, all right, hit the carina back up, activate, and pull back. I promise you, if that patient has a lot of secretions, my technique is going to clear out a lot more music, music a lot more music, mucus <coughs> than that. Okay, you're going to leave a lot of mucus behind. If you pass through, if this is a pool of mucus and you pass through quickly, you're leaving a lot there. So this is my recommendation to you. You have 15 seconds to accomplish this. That's a lot of time. Okay, go down, hit the carina. Okay, back up, start suctioning. You hit a pool, you just stay right there until the pool clears. Once the pool clears, then come back, 
until you hit another pool. Clear the pool, once the pool is completely cleared, then come back some more. Periodically release, just periodically re release in case in the vacuum uh, causes the suction catheter to stick to the side of the trachea. You releasing it once in a while will release that pressure as you move back and you won't tear out as much tissue. Suction can cause a lot of damage. If that's up too high, okay, or if you get adhered to the side, this thing just doesn't want to work with me today. All right, so again, you suction, nothing, 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 release, pull back, nothing. Here's a pull, I'm gonna stay right there. I'm gonna stay right there, suction, suction, clear. Keep pulling back, keep pulling back, keep pulling back. Okay. And anyways, and uh, if you feel like you've left mucus behind, then go back in again. Now let me give you some, some warnings here. If this patient is on high peep, if this patient is on high peep, I think high peep is 10 and up, 10 and 12, 15 and up. That's, that's significant peep. And they need that peep to keep those alveoli recruiting, to oxygenate them. Patients who are on high levels of peep are usually having a lot of trouble oxygenating. They're usually on high FiO2s. And if you look at their blood gases, their PaO2s are 60s. That they're, they're low. And so, if you start suctioning, you're pulling out volume and pressure, what do you think is going to happen to the peep? You're going to lose it, and you're going to see your patients desaturate. you got to be a little quick with these guys, and you can't be too repetitive. You've got to, you know, do your thing, come out, and just take a look. What am I doing here, you know? Just give the patient a little time to oxygenate, give the vent a little time to recruit the alveoli, give them a little time. If you go back in and you start sucking again, you start pulling out volume, start pulling out peep, you're gonna watch that patient desaturate. And it was. may take them a little while to come back up. It happened to me with a student in one of our first clinics. I was over there at Baptist. The guy was on high peep. I stayed in there a little bit too long. He was like, oh crap, <laughs> off to go. This guy started to desaturate to a very uncomfortable level, to a point where I pulled him off the vent, put him on a bag, and I started recruiting his alveoli. I started bagging to a point where I was starting to trap air and recruiting the alveoli, and then all of a sudden, it came back up. That's Once that, it was stable, nice. I put him back on the vent. But I was like, you know, that's just not a comfortable feeling, especially when you're not on your home turf. You know, you're the visitor, you're the instructor, or the student for that matter. So I'm just telling you from my own experience, you can de-recruit alveoli with section these patients on high FiO2s and high P. You gotta be a little careful about it. Okay, did I get that? Somebody had a question or input? No, that, that happens to us uh, in, in picking with, with the baby. Oh yeah. The suction the baby and he was in the, in, in the 40s with the sack. Yeah. 10, what do you mean 10 is the no, I'm just saying that I consider 10 high peak. 10, 12, 15, 20, I consider that high peak. Five a peep is kind of, we've replaced the physiologic peep. But anyways, you're not a baby, that's probably even more. So you understand that? Yes. So you wouldn't be able to utilize the plant, you'd have to take them off the vent and do the DVM? Well, I felt like at that particular time, that's what I was going to do. I thought it was a safe, fast way to re-recruit the LVL. I just hyperventilated the patient. I caused air traffic. I caused peep. I had the peep set on the bag, but by air trapping, I caused a little bit more. And I just And then, um, anyway, so I'm hyperventilating, but I'm also causing air trapping, and I'm re recruiting the alveoli. Once they were re-recruited, and I put them on the vent, Guy was fine. Yeah. He stayed there, you know, at his higher oxygen, uh, higher SO2 levels for a while. That's just a technique you can use. If I'm comfortable with the, like, if I've worked there and I knew the positions, uh, then I probably wouldn't have a problem just you know, bumping up the peak, you know, or bumping up the rate, or doing something for a few minutes, just a rescue, just a quick rescue. But again, it's not my facility. No one would have a problem with me bagging a patient, but they may have a problem with me manipulating the bed. That's all. So, you know, if it's your own turf and you know the doctors and they know you, you know, there's a trust relationship there, you can do a lot of things. But if you're a visitor, you're kind of limited. So I chose to do what I feel comfortable doing in a place where I don't work. 
Anyways, it worked just fine. It worked just fine. But a warning for you. Be careful. All right, so we good with that? All right, now what was I doing? Suctioning. All right, so now I'm done with my suctioning, and you know, I got a good amount of mucus out, and so I'm going to start the auscultation all over again. And I'm going to listen here. And uh, this is great. I don't hear the rumbling. I don't hear the coarse crackles anymore. And you know what? Most of the time, that's going to be true. Sometimes you just can't get them. They're a little bit out of your region. There they stay. You can't get rid of them. That's just the way it goes. But sometimes they clear up. It's great. Now we can hear the rest of the lung just wonderfully. All right. So I'm going to auscultate. And again, you want to auscultate in rhythm with the bed. You just don't go one, two, three, four. Oh, yeah. You, don't, you can't do that because you're going to miss everything. You have to auscultate in rhythm with the breathing, just like you would on a patient. Like, for instance, here's inspiration and expiration. I advise you to listen to it at least twice. Inspiration expiration. Okay, and then just move over. Okay. And again, don't forget to put these in your ears. <laughs> All right. You, okay, so you, that's, you should be in rhythm with the vid. You should inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration. Move to your next side. Inspiration, expiration. Okay. And anyways, you're going to auscultate. Let me just quickly just show you now the positions that you should cover. Okay, anterior. Okay, you can cover here, here. Just move down. Okay, still on the upper lobe, still on the upper lobe. And then you can move over here to the middle lobe, the right middle lobe here. You can move over here to the middle lobe. You can move over here to the lingula. And now what you're going to do is, so you've covered three spots. And if you notice, the pattern is always a C. It is always a C. Okay. And what, what is on the back that's right here? The scapula. Right. And that's exactly how you're going to auscultate on the back. You're going to do a C on the back. And you're going to go around the scapula. All right. So on anteriorly, you can go left, right, left, right, left, you know, left, right, right, left that on the front. But on the back, that's going to be hard to do because you have to do this, walk around, and then you look like a keystone the off right the back of the board there. Don't do that. So this is what you'll do. To auscultate the posterior, and I, I'd advise you that you always auscultate posterior. Always. If, if I'm your clinical instructor, I demand that of you. You'll auscultate 100% of your patients posteriorly. And you'll say, Mr. Slocum, these 400 pounds. I'll show you how to do it. You can auscultate any patient, okay, any patient posteriorly. And you should, because that's where all the pathology is going to be. Patients who are on their backs all the time, the pathology is greatest in the dependent, what we call the dependent portions of the lung. It's always going to be posterior. So this is how you'll do. You're going to come to the back here, and I just posterior apical segment in the back, you're going to listen to that. Most of the time, that's pretty clear. If you can't get to it because the patient's pillow is down, just take the pillow, cock it a little bit, and then you can get right down there. Now, you're, then you're going to come and you're going to listen to the superior segment of the lower. Oh, yeah. Come on up here. <laughs> can, I use your, can I use your back for a minute? Oh, good. All right. Here. Just like that. You know what? So you're going to auscultate here first, and now we're going to come right here. See, this is the her scapula, it's right here. Okay. Right about there in the center of the scapula between the spine is the superior segment of the lower lobe. Believe that? The lower lobe goes up that high. Okay? It does. It comes up this high in the back, and this is the superior segment of the lower lobe right there. So you're going to auscultate there, and then the last place you're going to auscultate on the back is going to be right here. That's, we're gonna look. We're gonna listen to the posterior segment of the of the lower lobe, the basilar segment down here. Now let me show you where that's going to be. If I put my uh, finger right here, just up underneath her uh, scapula, if I just place my hand right up under her scapula, right there, you see the width of my hand. That, for the most part, is where you're gonna find the basilar segments right there. If you start going below that area, guess what you're gonna hear? You're gonna hear nothing. If you ever follow a therapist and all the breath sounds are diminished, and posteriorly, they might be too low. 
And that, that's easy to happen if you have a patient who's lying down. It's easy to shoot too low. Happens all the time. But anyway, so it's either you know three finger widths, four finger widths, just below the scapula. Use the scapula as your guide right here. Once you find that base, that border right there, just stay right in that area right in there. You don't need to go any lower than that, and you'll always hit your luck. Okay, all right, next. Now, there's some landmarks to help you, to help you find that. Watch, let me show you what they are. Okay, if, if I were, this is one way you can do it. There's, I'm gonna show you two different ways to do it. If I were to take my middle finger and I were to put it on my xiphoid right there and lay my hand down like that, if I put my middle finger on my xiphoid, my middle finger on the patient's xiphoid <laughs> and lay my hand down like that, on, that's where the posterior segments are gonna be on the back, on this patient. Now, if they're standing up and the weight of the blood and, and the lung tissue, they'll pull it down and it'll be a little farther, but these patients are not standing up. These patients are lying back and their abdominal contents are pushing the lung up. Do you understand that? It's gonna be up a little <laughs> bit higher. So I'm gonna find the xiphoid, I can do this, I can find the xiphoid like that, I can get an idea about where the bases are right in the back here. I can do it that way, or I can just take their arm and I can go like this. Where does the top of my arm go for the most part? Right across my xiphoid, isn't that where it is? And so all I need to do is I need to auscultate right here. Okay, stay, I always tell everybody, this is so that they, they won't ever miss, you see that right there? You see right there? Don't go below that. Just don't go below that around the back. So here's your gut. Your patient's lying down, you'll see me. I'll be in the clinic, I'll do this. I'll take the patient's arm and I'll put it right there. And I'll actually, I'll actually, I'll take the patient's arm like this, and I'll take this arm here, okay, and I'll put it like this. You're good, just stay where you are. You're good, and I'll put my hand right there on her back. My fingers are on her back, do you see that? And this hand here, this palm is holding that elbow, because that elbow is gonna wanna drop. It's gonna wanna drop back on the bed. But my hand is holding it just like that. And then I take my stethoscope, and I just push it right up underneath. Okay, so I'm gonna take the elbow and I'm gonna push it right here. Okay, and I see my landmark. Okay, here's the bottom of the elbow, here's the top of the forearm. I put my hand right here. Okay, and now I've got the patient's elbow held with my hand. And now I just take my stethoscope and I'm gonna take the stethoscope and I'm going to push it into the bed. I'm gonna push it in the bed. I don't have to lift the patient. I don't have to lift it, but the only thing I ever do is I lift the skin or I draw the skin tight. So I draw the skin tight with my fingers and then I push the bed in and then slide my stethoscope right under there. So I'm gonna listen between the scapula and the spine to get the superior uh, segment of the lower lobe. And then I'm gonna move down and I'm gonna put my stethoscope right on the basis right there and I'll listen. Remember, take your time. Listen quietly, get a couple breaths, make sure you hear a couple breaths, make sure you listen to complete inhalation and complete exhalation. You'll hear a lot of incredibly interesting breath sounds. All right, so you'll do that, then you'll walk over to the other side and you'll do that same thing. Are okay, you good on that? No. So that's how you're going to, uh, you're gonna listen to breath sounds. Okay, did I skip number eight? Yes, I did. Okay, sorry, skip, uh, skip number eight, let me back up. Number eight is chest assessment, mm -hmm. symmetry. Symmetry is the rise and fall of the left and right side simultaneously. <coughs> what happens if one side is rising and the other is not? What might that be? No ventilation on the lung. Yeah, it could be no ventilation. That too could be in the right main stem and therefore this is not rising. So there's a little things that can give you a clue. Or you could have a pneumothorax and pneumothorax can cause the lung not to rise. So you wanna look for symmetry. So in this practicum, you're just going to say with your mouth. I'm doing the chest assessment, I'm looking for symmetry and paradoxical breathing. What is paradoxical breathing? When you inhale, it goes in. Right, when you see, most of the time the chest and abdomen should rise simultaneously. When you see this happening, when you see the abdominal pulling down, the abdomen pulling down, and the chest moving up, what you have is a patient in distress. That's what you have, you have a patient in distress. Uh, you could also, well, you could also have maybe the sensitivity on the bed is not enough. The 
patient's pulling but not able to trigger the vent. So you're going to look for symmetry, paradoxical breathing, and then you're going to palpate for tracheal deviation. Palpate for tracheal deviation, as you know, you're going to find here the sternal notch. Right? You see how the stern, sternum has this little notch in it? You're going to find the sternal notch. You just simply move your finger right up here. You just palpate the trachea, make sure that it's midline and not shift. You don't find it too often. You don't find tracheal shifts too often, but once in a while you will. You go, hey, we're quick, but <laughs> you go over and look at the X-ray. It's like, Grr. way over here. But not too often, but once in a while. But you palpate the trachea, and you know that the trachea will shift with very large uh, uh, pleural effusions or, or tension pneumothorax or even other pneumothoraxes. Mm -hmm. So the trachea will shift. So those, that's the chest assessment. But you're going to have to say. I'm looking at the chest and assessing for symmetry, paradoxical breathing, and then for the tracheal deviation, you actually have to palpate. Okay, you don't palpate for tracheal deviation like this. You don't do that. This is not how you palpate for tracheal deviation. Okay, you don't do that. You don't grab the trachea and go, oh yeah, there it is. You have to line it up with something, don't you? You have to line it up with this sternal notch here. You have to line it up, find the notch, and then move up. Move up. You don't grab the trachea. Yep, there it is. You have to line it up with this notch and feel if it's midline with the notch. All right. So you can look all this stuff up on YouTube to show you how to do these assessments. I think you got some of this in 1024, right? Okay. All right. Now um, we're, we're we already did our suctioning. That's already done. You got to record. Where do you record stuff? On the bag. Record amount, color, viscosity, and secretions. You just make it up. Okay, whatever, you know. Whatever your little imaginations can come up with. Like say purple? <laughs> right, I love it. <laughs> you look like a rainbow. <laughs> all right. Now, all right, so we're, we're good with that? How are we doing on time here? I've been going for 42 minutes. Well, here, I'm going to take a break. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to look, part of our assessment is going to be looking at the endotracheal tube. You're going to record the size and position of the tube. Now, I don't really know why people record the size all the time, like what, somebody's going to change this thing in the middle of the night. <laughs> hey, somebody, why did you do that? I don't know, but I'll figure it out one day, right? So, uh, <laughs> anyways, we have to record the size, and but the position is very important. Did I steal somebody's sheet? Is that yours, Vicky? All right, but the, the position is very important. Okay. You know, um, <clears throat> once the patient is initially intubated, let's just say in the emergency department, initially intubated and taped in place, the next thing that's done is a chest x-ray. And if the endotracheal tube is three to five centimeters above the carina, thumbs up. They say, okay, the endotracheal tube is in good position, taped at 22 centimeters or millimeters, centimeters, 22 centimeters at the lip. Or most people don't use the teeth anymore. They don't usually use the teeth, teeth they usually use the lip. 22 centimeters at the lip. Um, Isn't that millimeters? Let me see. <coughs> Might be wrong, you know. All right, but we'll we'll vary. Twenty-two at the lip. All right. <coughs> Centimeters. Five twenty-one on the sheet. Yeah. Okay. Good. You know why that's good? Because this is why you verify. Let's just say that my note here, like Gabe just pointed out, says 21 centimeters. And, and I go and I look at the two, and it says 25. What? Why is there a four centimeter, it is centimeters, why is there a four centimeter difference? It could be that there was a follow-up x-ray, the tube was out too far, and the doctor said, push it in four centimeters. That'd be a lot. Let's just hypothetically. So then you would, you would have to uh, also tape. 
No, you would have to, certainly auscultation might reveal that, and you also might look at the AM chest x-ray, which might reveal that. But it could be that the doctor already examined the x-ray, already told the therapist to move it, and it is legitimately in where it should be, but the therapist just didn't update their charting yet. But in that case, there should be an order on the chart. Whenever the doctor tells you to move the tube, it's supposed to be written in the chart. It's supposed to be there. So you have to verify, is that where it's supposed to be? But if you look and it says 21, and you look, come over here and you say 25, okay? And then you auscultate, you see the breath sounds are a little diminished on one side. Then you look at the AM uh, X-ray and you go, man, that thing is way down there. It's down on the right main stem, you know, you've got to know some, notify somebody, say, hey, this, this doesn't look right to me. This looks like it's too deep. The doctor will verify it, and then more than likely, you'll be instructed to pull it out. What happens if a, if a tube, let's say, is, remains in the right main stem? The left lung collapses. Your left lung is going to become mm -hmm. atelectatic. Can, can you go straight to the left lung to say? Sure, you could also take the left lung. You're talking about uh, here the absence of breath sounds or diminished breath sounds? Yeah, sure. Right. And, and I, it, as a matter of fact, there was a student a few semesters ago. The patient was innovated. They asked, they just told the doctor, you know what, I don't hear anything on the left side. Sure enough, x ray came back, that tube was down too far. So you can hear it. Um, uh, all right, so you have, to, you have to manage that situation. So in this practicum, if there is a discrepancy between what is here on your sheet and what's actually on this patient, you have to tell. You have to tell your instructor as if it were the nurse. What's going on here? Oh, well, the doctor came, you know, read the x-ray, had the, had the therapist move it. I'm going to write the order now. You know, they'll say something to you. Or, you know what, that's absolutely wrong. We're going to need to pull that back. Or I'm going to need to notify the doctor and ask them to pull it back. You good with that? The whole point is, is that it's part of our assessment. We need to verify it. So don't overlook that step. We have found countless tubes out of place. Students and I have found countless tubes out of place. Patients come in the emergency room, bang, they intubate them, they send them to the floor. We come in in the morning, we're like, wow, that thing's in the right main stem there. And nobody else has seen it but us. So we're like, oh. <laughs> we found something. <laughs> it's an exciting moment, you know? All right, that's good, you know, because it, you know, your theory becomes reality. But that is a regular thing, and you have to check it regularly. You have to check it every uh, every shift. You have to check it. So we verify the endotracheal tube. I'll perform endotracheal tube cuff, minimal occluding volume. At this point, I think it's good for us to take a break. Yeah, I think it's good for us to take a break, and we'll come back because there's more to cover. But I think uh, you guys want to take. Uh, why don't you take 20?